strikes in the night when the excursion steamer Neuronic, packed with sleeping passengers, is destroyed by fire at a Toronto, Canada pier. A few hours of horror, and then all that is left is a gutted, smoking hulk, consumed by flames which have trapped people below decks, in their cabins, or forced many of them to leap into the water. Most of the doomed passengers were from Cleveland and Detroit. 189 perished, with many missing and few identified. The survivor is still unnerved. I just wish that all the mothers who were on the boat with their children could be as fortunate as I am. The first outstanding victory in the Cold War between East and West is the end of the 10-month blockade of Berlin. Charlottenburg Station is again linked with Western Germany as trains begin to roll into the once isolated city. The steady stream of trucks start the movement of supplies, and though the magnificent American and British airlift had fed Berliners, they are no longer on short rations. Determined countermeasures force Russia to ease a dangerous situation. Lucky Lady, an Army B-50 bomber, takes off from Fort Worth, Texas on a super secret mission. Only the 14 men aboard and a few top Army men in Washington know that its planned performance is to remind potential enemies of America's might in the air. Iran in Saudi Arabia and the Philippines are two of four American bases that send aloft a B-29 flying tanker to refuel the globe-circling bomber. The two pilots talk each other into position and the gas begins to flow. Hawaii sends more gas aloft and soon Lucky Lady is due at home. Mission almost accomplished, Fort Worth is alerted, and here she comes. 94-hour non-stop flight and a superb feat by her commander, pilot James Gallagher. With the Red Army conquering China, fear-ridden Shanghai crowds see nationalist soldiers vent their fury upon suspected communist sympathizers who are executed in the streets with little ceremony. In a mood verging on panic, a crowd of 100,000 battle police to witness the executions as stark terror stalks the city. The end of all chance of democratic freedom approaches. The Red Army is at the gates. Communist shore batteries trap the British cruiser London in the Yangtze. 44 men are lost before she escapes to Shanghai badly battered. Americans and British leave by every means possible. Some have to be carried aboard trains as the traditional open door in China is slammed shut. With a flat ultimatum from Red authorities, civil and military contingents depart to avoid clashes that could spark a third world war. Nuns who have spent their lives in religious teaching know that communism will not tolerate them. Shanghai becomes another Red outpost. Philadelphia plays host to the 31st National Convention of the American Legion, led in parade by regular army men, honoring the victorious veterans of two world wars. The youngest drum majorette is an attraction, and though it's summer, Santa Claus comes from Indiana. A Minnesota Post is costumed colorfully in a spectacle of more than 60,000 men and women marchers. Fifty thousand of Rome's school children throng the Piazza San Pietro in Vatican City to greet Pope Pius on the 50th anniversary of his priesthood. His Holiness is touched by their devotion and declares that it is among the children of today that his hopes lie for a world that will not destroy itself. Lester Pearson, Canada's minister, signs. Robert Schumann, French foreign minister, joins his country with democratic nations. 
Ernest Bevan of England signs the agreement to aid any signatory nation attacked by an aggressor. United States Secretary of State Dean Acheson signs and President Truman keynotes our nation's reason for the historic pact. The treaty we are signing here today is evidence of the path they will follow. If there is anything certain today, if there is anything inevitable in the future, it is the will of the people of the world for freedom and for peace. Later, the president signs the bill providing funds for military aid to Atlantic Pact nations. The crew of a rescue plane looks down in horror on scenes of devastation in Ecuador as violent earth shocks continue. Frightened people run aimlessly about, others numbed by terror simply stand bewildered and helpless. 6,000 people perish, 25,000 are injured, 100,000 are homeless. In this ancient church, a priest was officiating at a children's mass, and now its granite walls are all but leveled. A grim search for injured is started as soon as nature's fury has abated, but it's difficult to evacuate hospital cases. Roads are blocked, rivers are swollen, all forces seem bent upon heaping an agony of suffering upon those already sorely afflicted. Practically the entire Western Hemisphere rallies to the help of Ecuador, many times shapen by quakes, but rarely suffering such ruin, horror, and grief. Suddenly erupting, one of the few active volcanoes of North America puts on a spectacular display that terrifies the people of this section of Mexico. Mount Paracutin sends up nature's fiery warning that beneath the Earth's surface there may still gather the forces for destruction to dwarf anything conceived by man. Only four years ago, this volcano wiped out a village and changed a fertile valley into a wasteland. Now a daring cameraman makes these films until heat drives him back and the volcano continues pouring forth molten rock from a witch's cauldron. There goes the flag, signal for the start of the 500 mile Memorial Day race at Indianapolis. 175,000 spectators see thrill after thrill as daredevil race drivers lose control of cars driven at breakneck speed and are out of the running. Here's a driver leading on the 24th lap when he loses a wheel and the car bursts into flames as it crashes the wall near horrified spectators. Other drivers dare not race through the wall of fire with possible wreckage beyond it. And here's Bill Holland who finished second in 47 and 48. He's gonna get the winner's flag at last as he flashes to victory. tension grows, Moscow is the scene of Prime Minister Stalin's birthday, and from all satellite nations, communist followers pay homage to the high priest of Marxism. Here on his 70th birthday, Stalin rules the hard core of world communism, which has divided the world into two armed camps. Proof of this division is the unrest evidencing itself in other parts of the world. Here, communist marchers are rioting in Tokyo. Both American and Japanese police are obliged to adopt stern measures after one GI has been injured. Elections have given the commies only one seat in the parliament, which may outlaw the party altogether. The demonstration was timed to precede the election, which gave the party supporting General MacArthur's policies an overwhelming majority. What they can't accomplish in a free election, they attempt by violence. Berlin, too, is the scene of smoldering communist unrest. Western occupation forces go on around the clock alert, ready for the communist youth push that would put the entire city in Soviet hands. For weeks, the Red Sector is kept aflame with every propaganda device in the commie repertoire. On 
the appointed day, as the parade gets underway, Berlin steels itself for violence. The vaunted gathering of half a million dwindles as the conquest of Berlin resolves itself to insults to the Western powers. When four ammunition-laden barges blew up in New Jersey's Raritan River, with a roar heard for 40 miles, the once prosperous and industrial town of South Amboy was left a shattered wreck. Four dead were taken from the ruins, and 22 barge crewmen vanished completely as the city of 10,000 crumbled under the blast. Hardly a home or business building was left undamaged. Declared a disaster area, the city is put under martial law and barred to all but rescue workers. The largest active volcano in the world, Mauna Loa, spills a record volume of red-hot lava on the Golden Isle of Hawaii. The molten stream moves relentlessly from the fiery cone, 13,000 feet above the sea, and scores of earthquake shocks accompany the outpouring. The deadly pattern streams down the flanks of Mauna Loa, a continuing menace to life and property. Five long, desperate weeks, the Canadian city of Winnipeg has battled the swollen waters of the Red River. More than 50,000 volunteer workers man the dikes to hold back the raging torrent. The Red Cross and RCAF transport more than 2,500 patients to safety. Almost one-third of the population are forced to abandon their city and flee to shelter in other areas. Total cost of the damage to Winnipeg is estimated in the millions. White Sands, New Mexico, a special camera is installed in a V-2 rocket for flight into the stratosphere. These remarkable pictures made by the Department of Defense show what the Earth looks like from 20 miles up. Seconds later at 58 miles, the curvature of the Earth appears with the rocket ripping through the air at 2,000 miles per hour. Five hundred thousand throng St. Peter's Square, where Pope Pius officiates at the first outdoor canonization ceremony in Catholic Church history. Maria Goretti, whose preserved remains lie in state at the Vatican, becomes saint of the church. Catholic pilgrims gather to revere the 11-year-old girl who was stabbed to death and on her deathbed prayed for her assassin. The United Nations forces stage a surprise invasion on the west coast port of Incheon in one of the most brilliant strategic moves of the Korean conflict. Marines swarm into landing craft for the invasion that will be an end run behind the North Korean lines. Under cover of a continuous barrage of rocket fire, the landing craft head for shore. They face an unknown strength in the Incheon garrison. Once again, the Marines are sticking their leather necks out. the Marines hit the beach, they land almost without opposition. This thrust has taken the Red Koreans completely by surprise. A few die-hard Reds, however, need to be flushed out. General MacArthur pays a surprise visit to the Incheon front to observe personally the brilliant achievement. He sees the results of perfect planning. It is a well-pleased general who issues a well done to his men. UN forces lose no time in their drive on Seoul. This is to be the turning point of the war. But even though the tanks blast their way through opposition, the going is not easy, and there is a price that must be paid for the victory. UN artillery is deadly effective, guided by the spotter pilots. He gives the range a direct hit. These films give a vivid picture of the grimness of this struggle. Every device known to modern warfare is used in the police action among the rice paddies of Korea. In 17 days after the Incheon landing, South Korean troops crossed the 38th parallel. The mighty battleship Missouri, her 16-inch guns rising to firing position, carries out her United Nations mission along the Korean coast. The big boys are ready for action to soften up enemy strong points. The target is zeroed in, and they let loose. These are the monsters that have spearheaded amphibious landings that have led to successful encircling movements. Shore batteries reply and score a near miss. 
The giant among sea giants, the Big Mo, puts in her wallop against the red aggressors. Tiny Wake Island. Here it was that a handful of Marines stood off Jap attacks for days. And here it is that President Truman, after an 8,000 mile flight, has his first meeting with General MacArthur, whom he has come to consult on the progress of the Korean War. In a simple radio shack, momentous decisions are reached. Secretary of the Army, Pace, and Admiral Radford attend the talk with the UN commander, whose allied forces at that moment were converging on the North Korean capital of Pyongyang. Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Omar Bradley, is also among the President's advisors. Before they part at the airfield, President Truman pins the fourth Oak Leaf Cluster to the Distinguished Service Medal on a chest that already bears almost every decoration a grateful nation can offer. In an effort to cut off Reds fleeing north to the Manchurian border, the 187th Airborne Regiment and 120 planes prepare for a drop 40 miles north of the Red Korean capital. Personally supervising and observing the operation is General MacArthur, who watches as the paratroopers drift down in a perfectly executed maneuver. In the words of the general, this closes the trap on the enemy. With a Sunday punch landed, the mop-up continues with UN forces storming north in relentless pursuit of the fleeing North Koreans. The stubbornly resisting Reds had to be blasted out of strong points, leaving behind burning villages, the dead and the captured. A total of almost 100,000 prisoners have been taken since the tide of battle has turned. A swelling column that heralds victory for the UN in Korea.